Good morning, Santa Rosa Christian Church. Um, I hope you guys were rocking out to that song just as much as we were uh, here this morning and just declaring the goodness and forgiveness of God and just how sweet it is. And uh, even in a situation, a circumstance like we find ourselves in right now, we can dance with joy and declare the goodness and the glory of God this morning. And uh, that's why we're here. Uh, We're celebrating. Uh, We are not uh, in defeat Uh, because there's one who's been victorious over sin and death and destruction, and that is good news, and that is cause for joy, that is cause for dancing. And so I hope you were dancing this morning uh, in your living rooms. Well, this morning, uh, we are continuing in our series uh, talking through just a couple of the Psalms of the valley, and uh, really just asking the question of what what does it look like for us to walk through the valley and, and how is it that we approach this circumstance here today? And, um, you know, this week, honestly, for me, it was, and my family, it was, a, it was a hard week. You know, people were asking, hey, how was this week for you? I feel like it's a, it's a weekly check-in, you know. And, uh, man, it was just tough. But, you know, as I was thinking about even this morning, you know, it doesn't even feel like a valley for us. In some ways, it feels like the desert. Um, you know, over the past five years, our family has gone through a ton. Uh, and whether it's moving after being in Ventura County for almost 10 years, moving to Northern California, uh, whether it's leaving a rental unit because we got toxic black mold in our house and having to move into my grandma's house, or whether it's, you know, for us, going through family hardship. Uh, every step of the way over the past five years for our family, we've, we've had to go through some really hard stuff. And, and man, just this, this circumstance is just one more thing on top of all the other things. Uh, we, I was, we were reading some, with some friends this week, and it's like, okay, we have one fire, and then we have another fire, and then we have rolling blackouts, and now we have a global pandemic. And it's like, okay, God, what are you trying to say here, and, and what, what is going on? And uh, I can speak honestly for myself that, you know, going through this journey has not, I haven't responded perfectly. And I've made a lot of mistakes. I continue to make those mistakes, but I can say with certainty that, that what has allowed us to carry on and persevere and be strengthened throughout the process hasn't been finding some new book or self-help thing Honestly, it's, it's been the presence of the Lord. Every step of the way, it has been the presence of the Lord, even when I didn't feel it. And that's true for us today, just as much as it was true for those who spoke in the Psalms centuries ago. And this morning, we're gonna be looking at Psalm 84. So I encourage you, if you're home and you got a Bible, to go ahead and turn to that passage. The psalmist says, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. And even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Blessed are those whose strength is in you and whose heart are the highways of Zion, to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs, and the early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good things does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Or, O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, we come before you this morning feeling vulnerable, feeling the weight of this circumstance, feeling the weight of the world, feeling the weight of life. But God, we come to you as the source of life. 
And God, we ask this morning that you would speak to us, that you would teach us your ways, Lord. And so God, we love you and we pray this in your name. Amen. Now this morning, I won't be able to get through the entirety of the psalm, but there are a few points that I just want to make this morning as we read Psalm 84. And the first is this, is that if we are to navigate this valley or this desert, we need patterns in our life. We need patterns in our life. Psalm 84 is attributed in this, what we read here to the, the sons of Korah. Now, the sons of Korah were part of the tribe of Levi, and therefore, their clan was part of taking care of the temple worship, the temple sacrifice. They were the priestly clan of the nation of Israel. And so they would have been well acquainted with these temple grounds and, and what it would like to be in the presence and the courts of the Lord. As we look at this psalm, we see that it's a psalm of pilgrimage, though. It's a psalm that is technically talking about or speaking about this journey that one would take to the temple of the Lord. And we understand pilgrimages as an intentional journey with, with a spiritual, religious purpose and going to a spot where God had revealed himself. In the Old Testament, it was typical for God's people to make these sorts of pil pilgrimages to Jerusalem. Uh, it was required by the Mosaic law to do it three times a year for different festivals. And it was likely even in Psalm 84, later in Jewish or Israelite history, that, that as, as people would make the pilgrimage to the Temple Mount, they would be singing out loud this very psalm as they ascended the hill of Zion. And we see examples of this throughout even the New Testament. When we look at Jesus' life and ministry, we see that during the times of Passover, the city of Jerusalem would swell in number from people all over the region and land taking pilgrimages to come to the Passover in Jerusalem. And these patterns of, were a way of life for the nation of Israel. We see throughout uh, the, the way that they were instructed to live by God in the law, God, God built in these patterns for them. And whether it was the festivals or even the pattern of the Sabbath to rest one day a week, or the pattern of prayer, or memorizing and reciting out loud the Torah of God's holy scriptures. These patterns were ingrained within the fabric of God's people. And this psalm is spoken of in that context, the spiritual pattern of life that grounded God's people in his eternal presence. See, these patterns serve to ground God's people in a perspective that allowed them to wisely navigate life and the physical reality around them in a way that brought flourishing, spiritual flourishing in the way that they lived. And this is why it's necessary and important for us today to continue to develop patterns in our daily lives. See, God instituted the very first pattern of life which was to rest on the seventh day. He himself instilled that. And if we are to have spiritual vitality in this moment, in this circumstance, if we are to be like, as the psalmist says, that tree that is planted by streams of living water that yields fruit in season and out of season, then we need to institute patterns in our daily lives. Patterns of prayer, patterns of fasting, even patterns of pilgrimages, patterns of Sabbath and scripture reading, patterns of community and taking communion with one another, patterns of silence and solitude and sitting and basking in the presence of the Lord. It's these patterns that allow us to hold a healthy and accurate perspective that we are not swayed by our external circumstances, but we are grounded in the eternal God. And these practices over the years may have been distorted in different ways. Uh, for some, they're seen, seen as modes of legalism. Uh, for others, they're seen in a mystical light where there's this hidden knowledge of God. But God does not hide himself. And God wants us to approach such patterns for us today so that we can tap into his presence, that we can open our hearts and meditate on him day and night. 
And so that when these life circumstances come our way, which they will, God knew that they would, we are grounded. We are not shaken. Jesus says that we would be like that that foundation that has bedrock, and when the storms come and they rage and try to knock us down, we stand fast and we hold firm with courage and with strength. And for us today, this is what we need to be doing. We need to wake up in the morning and spend time in prayer. We need to be in the word of God. We need to be connecting with one another in community. We need to be constructing patterns in our daily life to ground us in the one thing that will not be shaken. Secondly, we need the hands of God. We need the hands of God. The pilgrim is separated from the temple and he meditates on it. In verse one he says this, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. He meditates on its beauty and and its majesty. His very soul, his entire being, his flesh and his heart are crying out to be in its courts to the point where he is singing out loud to the living God. What's interesting about even the sons of Korah, they were known to be those as part of the temple uh, Levitical tribe that would stand outside and actually sing out loud in the courts of the temple. And so we see this point that, that this psalmist is singing out loud to the living God. And it's not a song of lament. It's not a song of defeat. It is a song of joy. And what's important to note here is that, that when we read the temple of the Lord, that it's not speaking of this physical place that that was his main desire. See, what was behind the temple was a veil. It was God himself. It was his presence that resided in that temple. And the temple was the only place of realizing the presence of the living God during that time. And he goes on to describe precisely that, that this God that he worshiped and praised, this presence that he longed for was rooted in the living God. That he was the source and the sustainer of all life, but he was not just the God who lives, but he is the God who causes everything to live. He is sovereign in all things. And he goes on to share about his happiness and even how the sparrows that nest in the crevices of the walls of the temple, that they are blessed He longs to be even a sparrow in the presence of the Lord. He goes on to describe God as my king, my God. He's not referring to two different people here, see? See, God has two functions that he's speaking to. He's both the God over all creation that is to be worshipped, the one who by his very breath and his mouth spoke everything into being the one that brings life forth and sustains all of it, but he is also the king that rules over him. He's the one in who has ultimate authority over his life and whom his allegiance lies. See, if God is sovereign, we are in his hands. Let me say that again. If God is sovereign, We are in his hands. We put our trust in him. And here's the thing, is when we trust in the sovereignty of God, it makes the difference. It changes everything. I had an opportunity to hear a great illustration on this this week. That all of life really depends on whose hands that we put our life into. See, when I look at myself, if I were to take something like a basketball, it might be worth like $15, but you put that same basketball in the hands of somebody like LeBron James, it's worth 15 million. You take a football, might be worth 30 bucks, who knows. But you put that football in the hands of somebody like Aaron Rodgers, it's worth millions. You take something like a golf club, maybe that golf club's worth 50 bucks, but you put that golf club in the hands of somebody like Phil Mickelson, it's worth millions. See, the point is, It matters whose hands it's in, doesn't it? You take something like a stick. I might not be able to do a whole lot with a stick. I might be able to beat something or break something. But you put that stick in somebody like the hands of Moses, and it parts the Red Sea. 
You take a slingshot, it's a child's toy. I might be able to knock a can over, but you put that slingshot in the hands of somebody like David, and he defeats a giant. It depends on whose hands it's in, doesn't it? You give me a fish and a loaf of bread, and I can feed myself. You put that same thing in the hands of Jesus, and it feeds thousands. Depends on whose hands it's in. You give me a couple nails, I might be able to fix a door build something with it, but you put those nails in the hands of Jesus, and he puts an end to sin and death once and for all. You see, it depends on whose hands it's in. You take all these worries, all these fears, all these problems, all this anxiety, and if you keep them in your own hands, that's all those things will ever be. But if you take those same worries, those same fears, those same problems, and you put them in the hands of Jesus Christ, he's going to see you through this circumstance. He's going to take care of every need that you have. That's why Jesus says, hey, look at the birds of the air. Look at the flowers of the field. My heavenly Father clothes this entire universe in beauty and cares for them. Every single need. They do not worry. They do not stress. They do not fear. How much more does he care for you? It matters whose hands they're in. And this morning, I would encourage you to trust in the hands of the Lord. Trust in his sovereignty. Trust in his goodness. Don't hang on to it. Allow yourself to release all that you are, all of that fear, all that anxiety, all that stress, everything, your hopes, your dreams, your finances. Allow them to be in the hands of the Lord. Finally, we need the presence of the Lord. We need the presence of the Lord. It's interesting that the psalmist mentions happiness here. He sings in verse 5. What does he say? So, Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose heart are the highways to Zion. He's singing of blessedness, of joy. They're making their way through the valley of Baca, through this dry, desolate wilderness. They're making their way through the hardest part of their journey, the part which will leave them most susceptible and vulnerable to attack, to starvation, to dehydration, to death. And yet we find this person singing about his happiness, his blessedness, his joy. And normally when I think about myself going through the desert, I'm thinking, I'm not singing of joy, I'm just trying to buckle up and survive. But that's not what he's doing. Why does he do this? In verse five, he says, what? Blessed are those whose strength is in you and whose heart are the highways to Zion. Their strength is in Yahweh. Their hearts are set on pilgrimage, meaning that their hearts are set on the final destination, which is being in the presence of the Lord. And in verse 7, it says that they go from strength to strength, meaning that as they move forward in this journey, as they move forward in vulnerability and through this desert, their strength doesn't weaken, it gets larger. It grows. Because why? They're getting nearer to the presence of the Lord. In the book of Psalm, the presence of the Lord is this distant idea of, of being with God. It leads them into the wilderness in the first place. It's what sustains them through the wilderness, and it's what invigorates them to overcome it. And today, like that psalmist, there are times when God calls us into the valley and through that desert. And whether we go unwillingly or willingly, right now that's where we're at. Our circumstance, this pandemic, was not something we chose. It's something that's happening. It's something that's outside of our control. And like the psalmist, we may, many of us might find ourselves in a place where we feel really vulnerable. We feel like we're in that place in the desert where we're most susceptible to attack. We're emotionally, physically, spiritually drained, and we're wondering what's going on. And our perspective in that journey and how we respond to this vulnerable moment and how we deal with it largely will shape how it really affects us and shapes us and who we are. 
The psalmist was able to enter into that space with joy, to endure it with perseverance, to overcome it, and being stronger than when he went in because he drew, he drew nearer to the presence of the Lord. And for us today, it's a call to do likewise. We're in this moment, there's vulnerability, but it's an opportunity for us right now to draw near to the presence of the Lord, not to run from it, but to press into it. See, the difference though for us today is that unlike the psalmist, where the presence of the Lord was seen in this physical temple, this physical destination through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit now calls us his temple. And it moves from a physical destination and resides now within us who put our trust and hope in him. The presence of the Lord has been released to the power of the Holy Spirit. The, to the temple is no longer needed. We have direct access to God. And what are we doing with that? What are we doing with that? The Israelite people would take three journeys a year that would put their lives at stake just to be in the presence of the Lord. And God says, my presence now dwells in you through the power of the Holy Spirit. You have it. But are we taking that for granted? Are we tapping into that? Because today, tomorrow, and the next day, it's an opportunity for us to press deeper into that presence. It's an opportunity for us to find joy in the Lord despite our circumstances. As we draw closer and closer to him, we grow in strength, we grow in comfort, we grow in our faith. And when we push further and further into that presence, the strength of the Lord brings about perseverance in us. We don't weaken, we actually grow in the midst of this moment. And the power of the presence of God is manifested in us and how we live. It brings about that strength, that boldness, that confidence, and that authority that the power of the living God is not in a temple, but it's in us. Jesus told his disciples, it's better that I go because the one who comes will do greater things in you than I have shown you. Do you believe that? Do we live like we believe that? And today, this week, tomorrow, each day that we step forward in this moment is an opportunity to set patterns in our life. It's an opportunity to live before God open-handedly and say, God, here you are. It's an opportunity to say, Lord, I want to press deeper and deeper into your presence. May I decrease and may you increase in my life. And may that be so this week. May that be so today as we end our time together. We're gonna have an opportunity this morning uh, as we close our time uh, to meet in groups. I just want to ask, as we put up that slide for those, those open Zoom meetings, as you come together in your life groups in those Zoom meetings, that you would pray for the presence of the Lord to overflow in your lives. This is not an opportunity to fear. This is an opportunity for boldness. This is an opportunity for Courage. This is the opportunity to step into new areas of life because the living God dwells in us. It's an opportunity for redemption. It's an opportunity for deliverance. It's an opportunity to step in the fullness of faith that Jesus Christ has called us to. May you pray into that this morning. We love you. Let me go ahead and pray as we close. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time together. We thank you for the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit in our lives today, Lord. To not just endure the storm, not just endure the desert, but to overcome it in greater strength than ever before. We love you, Jesus, and we pray this in your name. Amen.